Hi, I'm Rune Stensvold from the UEG Education e-learning team. Today I'll be talking to Dr. Heidi Staudacher, who will bring us up to speed on IBS and nutrition. Heidi is based at University of Queensland, where she is a research dietitian. So Heidi, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. Um, in Denmark, where I'm based, uh, irritable bowel syndrome um, is um, estimated to affect like 16% of the adult population, so a lot of people affected. Here in 2018, what are our options in terms of alleviating the symptoms of IBS patients and what type of research do you see necessary to be able to better guide and help these patients? Mm. From a dietary point of view, I presume, yes. presume you're asking about. Yeah, well, we've got a few different options and usually what we would recommend as dietitians is just to screen that the patient's having a healthy diet, that they're eating regular meals and they're not going overboard with certain dietary triggers like caffeine and alcohol. That often isn't quite enough for people. Um, so we have other options like the low FODMAP diet, which you may have heard of, which is effective in a large proportion of patients. Um, but for some patients, a probiotic supplement or a fibre supplement can also be effective. So it's a matter of assessing the patient, what's their most predominant symptom, and then going from there. And also, obviously, involving the patient in the process, so finding out what they would, would like to do. So sort of like an individualised uh, approach? Definitely. Yeah. Mm. So uh, etiology-wise, I mean, the etiology of IBS, what do we know about that mm. now in 2018? Have we come any further? Uh -huh. We know a lot. Um, we know that it's complicated um, and there's lots of different factors, both centrally, so in the brain, we know anxiety and depression are really prevalent and that can drive some of the symptoms. We know there's um, alterations in the microbiota in a subset of patients. Um, we know that visceral hypersensitivity, so just sensitivity of the gut to whatever's in the lumen can be quite prevalent in, in a lot of people. Um, and there's, there's a range of other different factors as well. So it's complicated and it's probably different from one patient to the next. So we're learning, but we're not quite there yet. So going back to uh, the diet, uh, I was thinking about fibre. I think fibre is not just fibre, is it? Um, how do you see that in an IBS nutrition context? context? Mm. Um, so are you referring to the fact that there's lots of different types yes. of fibres? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, it's a really complex group of substances. So we know that there's simpler types of fibres that are sort of not so complex in their chemical structure and then there's others that are much more complex um, in terms of their chemical composition. And we know that they behave differently in water um, depending on wh whatever fibre we're talking about. And that some are really quite rapidly fermentable in the gut and others are much more slowly fermentable. So in irritable bowel syndrome, we've got to be careful about what type of fibre that we use. And it would usually be um, in patients that have constipation predominant symptoms that we would usually trial the fibre supplement um, if the patient was willing to do so. I've seen that there's a lot of research into um, IBS and gut microbiota. And uh, I was wondering, uh, have you come across any interesting research displaying or identifying certain microbiota patterns linked to IBS? Mm. Yeah, there's been a little bit of work done in that field. And probably the biggest study um, that I'm aware of was published, I think it was last year, by Magnus Simran, Simran's group. And they showed that there was this microbial signature that they could um, identify using statistical, quite complex statistical methods. And one particular feature was that in people, particularly with more severe symptoms, that the, they had a much lower diversity of types of bacteria in their gut. Um, and that seemed to be independent of um, dietary composition and medications, um, and also transit time, which has also been shown to be linked to microbiota composition. So really interesting work. Um, but I think, yeah, there's still more that we need to know. Still again. more, yeah. And along those lines, I would also like to briefly ask you about FMT. Has that been trialled in IBS patients, fecal microbiota transplantation? Mm. Or is that still to come? Yeah, I, there's certainly been trials performed. This yeah. is not an area that I'm yeah. an expert in. Yeah. Um, 
but it's still very preliminary okay. in IBS that I'm okay. aware of. So lastly, I would like to ask you, um, what is the major gap in your opinion in terms of managing IBS? Mm. Where, where do we really need some more knowledge and information? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I think we have a number of different dietary tools we can use, but it would be great if we could know at the outset what intervention was, was going to work for that patient that was sitting in front of us. So having an idea of who was going to respond and who wasn't going to respond so that we could help people more quickly rather than ha having them go through the process of trying this treatment, this treatment until we get to the right one. So I think that's, that's quite... That should be next on the agenda. Thank you very much. And thank, thank you, you very much for coming. Uh, and if you're interested in Heidi's work, uh, please go to the UEG Education Library where you can look up uh, some of the talks from, for instance, UEG Week 2018, where Heidi's presentations will be as well. Thank you for watching.